A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. The song we are about to sing, the songwriter was blind, but that didn't stop her from praising the wonderful Savior. Psalm 118 verse 14 mentions that our strength is the Lord. So whatever spiritual disability that we are going through today, let us remember that we have a wonderful Savior and he will give us strength day by day. Let us sing together a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, in SDA 520.
The song that we will be singing now is He Touched Me. It's a medley. And when we, go, when we sing this song, it's basically about all the things and the good things that God has done for us. Let's sing together.
would like to invite the congregation to stand as we say our opening prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel of God which you promised before through your prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. We thank you for calling individuals to serve in a special way in the gospel of your Son, who are ready to preach the good news to all to whom you send them. As we spend this time together at the special ordination and commissioning blessing service, we pray for your presence, your guidance, and your blessing here. In Jesus' name, amen. If you were to ask Daniel and say, Daniel, what time is it? When, when does this occasion take place? What time is it? in the prophetic history. Daniel would say uh, it is taking place just after the dividing of the kingdoms in Daniel chapter 2 and before the kingdom of the stones. W when is that, Daniel? I it is, I can even go further, this is Daniel, I can even go further and say in Daniel chapter 8, it is, um, in Daniel chapter 7, it is after the beginning of judgment, but before the destruction of the little horn. But Daniel would hasten to say, but ask John. John has written much on that. John, John the Revelator, what time is it? And, and John would say, uh, have you read the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3? It is taking place in the era which is symbolized by the Laodicea church. A and John would say, that's not the end of the story. I can, I can take you to the seals. It is taking place between seal number six, which is an event before the second coming of Jesus Christ, and seal number seven, which is silence in heaven for 30 minutes. Silence because heaven has been depopulated of uh, Jesus Christ and the angels that are moving towards the earth to fetch the saints who would have heard the trumpet, the ark trumpet, the, 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 the trumpet, and they have been resurrected. What time is it, John? Well, I can take you to the trumpets. The trumpets, this occasion takes place between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. The sixth trumpet being the events just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. The seventh trumpet being the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of God. That is the second coming of Jesus Christ. What time is it, John? What time is it, John? John would say, well, I can still say more, but these events, the plagues, are still in future of this event. And, and, John, and, and, and while John is trying to wrap his story, Matthew saying, I also have some prophetic portions in my book. W what is that, uh, uh, Matthew? Matthew chapter 4. And this kingdom of the, and this gospel of the kingdom, shall be preached throughout the world. Then the end will come. What time is, what time is it, uh, Matthew? It is right at the beginning of the end, before the second coming of Jesus Christ. So it is not business as usual. So this uh, commissioning, Sister Penny, this uh, ordination, uh, Pastor Ben, uh, Pastor Penny, Pastor Ben, this commissioning is not business as usual. You are being commissioned at a critical time of the Earth's history. You are at the end of time. And the message of the end of time is fear God and give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and earth and the sea. And, 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 this, and, and we are called to preach the everlasting gospel to the whole world. So it's not business as usual. We, are, we will be confirming you, we will be laying hands on you, saying, go and preach and finish this work in righteousness. And with this, those few words, 
I would like to welcome the participants, uh, those that will be leading this, prog this program and those that will be participating. And I also want to welcome the, the audience that is uh, viewing this uh, through virtual platforms. Uh, please pray for this, uh, pray for this occasion. Pray for the audience, pray for them that the unctioning of the Holy Spirit will be on them so that when they go and preach the word, which they have already started, the reason why we have this occasion was simply confirming what has, ta what, what has been taking place. And please feel welcome, let's continue. I will not mention the names because if I mention the names, then I will, ha I will come back and apologize to those whose names I did not uh, mention. Uh, I want to welcome the families that are here to support uh, both uh, Pastor Penny and Pastor B. Uh, please feel welcome. And those that are also watching and uh, supporting this program, please feel welcome. And, and those that will be officiating. Um, uh, maybe I should mention those that are, at least, at least if I mention you, I don't have to mention uh, anyone this side. Um, uh, the gentleman who offered an, uh, an opening prayer. Pastor, Pastor D, Pastor, Pastor Don, Pastor Don, our pastor here. Uh, pastor pastor uh, Leon Dupree officiated this morning. He will be officiating again. Pastor Kolile Lifume, uh, he will be officiating. Uh, you will see them when, we, when they stand up. Uh, pastor Simba Msosu will be giving a sermonette. Um, Pastor Danny will be presenting uh, uh, Pastor Penny, and uh, past, uh, uh, let me see, no one is sitting behind you, Pastor Danny. Pastor Kunene is the, this is his program, we are assisting him. Uh, Pastor Plus will also be welcoming, uh, will be participating in the program. Mrs. Msosu also will be, there will be something that she will be doing on the stage here. Uh, Prop Eddie also will be, will be participating on the stage. These are the folks that will be. We have a gentleman who's sitting behind the curtains there, Mr. Lawrence. He's the one who has been running this program. We have this program because of, of him. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor, Pastor, uh, Pastor, Pastor Lawrence. It's prophetic. Thank you very much. With those few words, I would like to welcome everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Litsedi. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Leadership, I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a great privilege for me and honor to introduce to you an ordinance that needs no introduction. At this time, I'm going to call on Pastor Ben and Sister Joy to join us up front, please. As I said, it's an ordinance that needs no introduction. Pastor Benjamin Mackenzie was born in Northampton, England on the 28th of December, 1986. He's married to Jennifer Joy near Munez and they tied the knot in December of 2014. They have been blessed with a daughter, Rachel, four years and seven months old, and a son, Daniel, two years, and four months about. Pastor Benjamin graduated with a BA in theology and a BA in history and philosophy of religion from the Adventist University of the Philippines in March of 2010. He also holds a MA in religion from IAS, Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies, which he obtained in June of 2014. Pastor Ben joined the KwaZulu-Natal Free State Conference as an intern pastor in December of 2015. I was blessed and honored when I was asked to be Pastor Ben's mentor. It was soon obvious that Pastor Ben was extremely talented. 
Until then, I had never seen someone so ready and well-equipped to enter the pastoral ministry. He is a gifted and called pastor who is a powerful teacher and a powerful preacher who knows how to communicate Bible truths to both young and old. I honestly feel I have learned more from him than he did from me. He pastored in the Bloemfontein district where he took care of the Universitas Church as well as Shannon and Ashbury companies. Before joining the pastoral team, Pastor Ben served as the chaplain and Bible teacher for the Orem Independent School in Bloemfontein from January 2015 till September 2018. Pastor Ben currently serves as chaplain and lecturer at Halderberg College of Higher Education. Pastor Ben served the KwaZulu-Natal Free State Conference with zeal and much dedication for more than four years. Two years and nine months in pastoral ministry in Bloemfontein and one year and four months as the senior youth and public campus ministries director. The number of souls won under his ministry are 235 and counting. I present to you this afternoon, Pastor Benjamin McKenzie, joy is your wife. Pastor Benjamin McKenzie. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. All right. When I say happy Sabbath, you say happy day. When I say happy day, you say happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Wonderful. It's not a slogan. It's just an affirmation that a Sabbath is a happy day. Amen. I'm going to call upon uh, Pastor Penny with her husband to come to the front. We are glad to present to the SAU, Pastor Penny and her husband, Andre. Penny attributes her love for God, his word, and people to her parents, Audrey and Basil Preston, to whom she was born in East London in 1965. Penny studied a BCom at the University of Cape Town, UCT in 1983, after matric then worked in accounting for six years. In December 1989, she attended a Young Life Congress at Helderbeck, and in this very auditorium, she felt the voice of the Lord telling her that she would be studying theology the next year. She gave up her professional life in Cape Town to be a student, surprising all her friends, family, and colleagues. After graduating, she married Andrew Brink, in January of 1994. This was also her first year in ministry on a one-year-only contract with the then Cape Conference. She was placed in the Claremont Mowbray District with senior pastor Frank Boniface to specifically pastor the precious Adventist students at UCT. It was the most fulfilling and memorable year of her life using her pastoral gifting and training. Penny and Andre then left for South Korea to do mission work for three years. Upon their return, pastoral jobs were unavailable, but she promised the Lord to nev nevertheless only work for him. She worked as a media producer for Hope Channel at SID Media. She worked in the stewardship department uh, stewardship Ministries, rather, at General Conference, where she received her commissioned ministries, minister's credential 
in 2012. And currently, she works as a regional editions coordinator for the Adventist World magazine. Penny is completing an MA in theology, and she is passionate about contextualization of the gospel. I present to you Pastor Penny and her husband, Andre Brink. Thank you. You may be seated.
Greetings, friends. I must mention that when I was asked to do the sermon, at my first reaction was, uh, why me? Why must I be asked to preach at the ordination of uh, two preachers whom I look up to? But then I quickly realized that they can't preach at their own ordination. I don't think that would be appropriate. And I also figured that uh, since I have never preached at an ordination service, maybe time is running out on me. If, um, if I'm ever going to do it, maybe this is the time. It is a singular honor for me to share the word at this service, the commissioning service for Penny Brink and uh, B. Mackenzie. Um, I feel honored. And I want to mention that I would like to share with you a passage, maybe lessons that I learned from a passage that was especially meaningful to me at what one of my friends called my second call to ministry. I'm not going to go into detail in terms of that, but um, I believe this is a passage that was very influential uh, in um, shaping me and also bringing me uh, to where I am at this particular time. I would like to for us to go to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, I want to read the first five verses. And it says in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1, Now Moses was tending the flock of uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked up, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, and why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God said to him from the midst of the bush, um, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then the Lord said, do not draw near this place. Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I could easily go on, because this is part of the story, but uh, for the sake of time, I think, Let's just capture the story up to that point. Perhaps let's just pause for a moment to pray. Father, we pray that you may speak to us through this passage. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He was 40 years old, and uh, his study program in Egypt had just been completed, done and dusted. He was ready for mission. And to his credit, Moses was aware that his ministry and mission was nothing to do with the palaces of Egypt. His career was not going to be in the politics and administration of, of Egypt, even though Pharaoh and all the other people thought so. Moses was aware that he had a mission with God's people. Acts chapter 7 verse 25 tells us that, that Moses at that particular time, he wanted to deliver the children of Israel. He knew his mission. He was apparently very enthusiastic. And at the first opportunity in trying to do his mission, Moses was already beginning to throw punches and blows because he thought that's how he was going to accomplish this mission. And the next day after he had finished throwing punches and blows, he was trying a little bit of diplomacy, talking to these uh, fellow Israelites and trying to help them to understand that they should not be mean to one another. They needed to be delivered. But circumstances at that point led him to a 40-year detour. 
a long wait. A long, long wait. And in fact, in that 40 year detour, he wasn't even dealing with people, he was working with sheep. May I mention that sometimes God is not in a hurry. God has his own time. There are times when we may feel that things are taking long. It might even be the affirmation and confirmation to ministry or to whatever your mission is in life. There are times when we may feel that it's taking too long, it's taking detours that we did not plan for. But it's all in God's hands. It's all in God's hands. But with Moses, when he was ready to start his work, it's as if God, who was going to be his employer, said to him, okay, you are ready to work. Show me your transcripts. And when Moses produced his transcripts, God perhaps took a look, a look at the, the transcript. You know I'm speaking in human terms. God doesn't need to look. But it's as if God looked and he says, aha, I see what you have on your transcript. But it looks like there is one more module that I want you to take. There's one more module that you need before you can start working for me. And unfortunately, it is not offered in the universities of Egypt. I'm going to have to enroll you into the University of the Wilderness. And it was going to be 40 years, 80 semesters, 80 semesters to complete this module, which I decided perhaps could be called Faith 101. Perhaps. And so Moses needed this bridging module before he could start work. 40 years. One would wonder why 40 years? Why take Moses through a 40 year detour? 40 year learning experience in the wilderness so that he can be able to serve 40 years in real life. I want to remind you that sometimes God is not in a hurry. If there are things that seem to take long in our lives, or maybe they take a wrong turn, as they sometimes will do even in ministry, let us remember that there's a God who has it all in his hands. He has it. And um, perhaps that 40 years in the wilderness was critical for Moses. I wonder what it would have been like if uh, Moses, the Moses we know at 40 years old, if he had been given the opportunity to live, to lead the children of Israel. Remember Moses, 40 years old, he threw punches. And he was able to bury some of his opponents. He was tough. I wonder what it would have been like in the wilderness if Moses had been taken fresh from the universities of Egypt to lead the children of Israel. Perhaps Moses needed that 40 year experience so that there would be certain kinds of transformation that would take place in his own life. And so that module, Faith 101, is something which was all embracing. It's something which dealt with his attitudes. It's something which dealt with his disposition. It's something which dealt with uh, the fact that he was not the center of everything. And that sometimes he needs to wait on God. And these are aspects that are not taught in any of our universities. We don't have modules for that. 
these are things that we as ministers, and I'm not just talking to the two, I'm talking to all of us who are ministers, that we need to remember to be taken to that wilderness experience. There are certain aspects of our work which are not granted to us simply by visiting a library. But there are aspects of our work which we get when we are in an audience chamber with him. And he allows us to have that opportunity to be able to learn from him directly. And with that, our dispositions are changed. But not only that, our attitudes, our relationship with him is touched. But not only that, there are certain things that we may even need to unlearn. Ellen White mentions in the book Patricks and, uh, Patricks and Prophets, page 247 to 248, she says Moses had been learning much that must be unlearned. The influences that had surrounded him in Egypt, the love of his foster mother, his own high position as the kingdom's grandson, the dissipation on every hand, the refinement, the subtlety, and the mysticism of the false religion, the splendor of idolatrous worship, the solemn grandeur of architecture and sculpture, all had left a deep impression upon him, or rather upon his developing mind, and molded to some extent his habits and character. I must mention that many of these things are not things that he had been taught perhaps directly in a classroom, but maybe just as part of Egyptian culture, part of what is happening. And uh, it is quite possible that for many of us ministers, many of us ministers, and many of you students, that even as you come to study theology, there are informal aspects of the curriculum that you learn that perhaps are not necessarily for your good. Perhaps you see a bad example from me. You see me lose my, 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 my temper perhaps. And all that becomes part of a hidden agenda or rather a, a hidden curriculum that you begin to assimilate. And part of that, God wanted Moses to unlearn. And as I speak to all of us as fellow ministers and to Christian brothers, because you also have a mission, whether you are pastors or not, let us remember that whatever our circles are, not even just in classes, but just our circles, our movement in the mall, our life in community in general, sometimes gives to us a hidden curriculum in which somehow we find ourselves being first in everything. And sometimes we find ourselves thinking that God's work solely depends on me and we forget that it is his work. And this is what Moses had done. He had hurried into ministry in a way that God did not expect him to. And so the 40 years were part of a time for him to unlearn certain things. It was also a time for him to to learn to trust God. It was a time for him to learn patience. Faith 101 taught him to become Christ-like until at a certain point he would say, just as Christ did, God, take my life for the sake of these people. Blot out my name if necessary and save these people. And so Moses, through those 40 years, he was learning to become Christ-like. And at the end of 40 years, at the end of 40 years, God comes and says, now I want to send you. And when Moses looks at himself, he says, I have nothing. I have nothing. Why don't you send someone else? Well, perhaps the 40 years had accomplished something. Moses needed to come to an awareness 
that he is not personally critical to the ministry. God can use somebody else. And now Moses realizes that. And God says, I can now use you. At a time when you are no longer self-sufficient. You see, 40 years earlier, Moses had been flexing his muscles and giving blows. He trusted his muscles. Forty years later, when he gives this excuse to God, send somebody else because I can't do it. I'm no longer able to speak. Send someone else, I'm not able to do it. In a sense, Moses was still looking to his muscles for success, unfortunately. And then God has to tell him that despite your having big biceps or no biceps, I can still use you. I could not use you when you had big biceps. I can choose to use you now when you have no muscles to show, when you are old and you can say, why don't you send somebody else? And in fact, this was at a time when God would say to him, what is in your hand? And Moses practically had nothing because all he had was a stick. What do you use a stick for to deliver a nation? He is bankrupt. Nothing. And at that point, brothers and sisters, when we sense our bankruptcy, God can take over. It is at that point that God can use us. I'm so thankful that God met Moses by that burning bush. The Bible tells us that at that burning bush, Moses saw it. He must have seen many burning bushes. Bushes in the desert are not great big trees. They tend to have just little twigs. And when they catch fire, they burn for a matter of minutes and they are gone. There isn't enough fuel to keep them going on. But there was this bush, it caught a fire, and uh, the Bible tells us, but it was not getting consumed. And Moses noticed that it wasn't getting consumed before he actually went to see it. Verse 3 tells us that when Moses saw this, then he turned aside to see why it wasn't getting consumed. In other words, this bush was burning for longer than usual. I imagine that Moses must have seen, oh, there is another bush burning. It will burn itself out. As long as it doesn't spread the fire, it's fine. And maybe Moses went around tending his sheep, and then he looked in that direction, and the bush still burns. And he said, well, maybe in a, in a short while it will go, and maybe, uh, perhaps, I'm using my imagination now, maybe an hour or two later, he looks, and the bush still burns. And then he goes to find out and he finds out the reason why the bush continues to burn. It is because God is fueling the fire. That bush doesn't have enough fuel to continue burning and burning and burning. It is God's act that is keeping it burning. When you check in the Adventist Bible commentary, you will find out that there is a suggestion that the burning bush symbolized Israel going through a lot of affliction, but God not allowing them to become consumed even by the slavery. But I want to suggest also that perhaps this was an object lesson for Moses. Perhaps you see yourself as a burning bush without much of fuel. You don't see how you can be able to go far, even in this mission. But look at the bush. The bush still burns. Moses, you are supposed to go and confront Pharaoh. You don't see where the fuel to do that will come from. But remember, the bush still burns. It's God who will fuel it. And Moses was going to lead the children of Israel 
by the Red Sea where they would become frightened. And while the children of, uh, of Israel are frightened and Moses doesn't know what to do, the bush still burns. God is still there to uphold Moses. And when there is no water, when there is bitter water in different places, when the children of Israel apostatize, and when the children of Israel rebel against him and they even want to stone him so that they go back to Egypt, thankfully for Moses, the bush still burned. He realized where to go to for resources. And even when his own family at one time turned against him and said, why do you want to be the only leader here? That bush still burned. We thank God for that 40-year experience. It gave to Moses what he needed. And so for us as ministers, sometimes the work is demanding. I want to remind each of you that the bush still burns. Our fuel comes from him. We may all be but a bush that cannot really last long under pressure. But God will keep the flame. The bush still burns. Sometimes the resources will run low. And sometimes our health may even begin to suffer. And we find our bodies perhaps becoming weak. Even in those moments when we are in pain, God is still our refuge. He's still there. And he can give us the hope to continue. We may feel emotionally drained sometimes because of different aspects of our work. But that bush still bends. Sometimes we may be misunderstood. The bush still burns. And we can get refueling from God himself. And so my friends, even as we work, we daily need to have that wilderness experience. We need time to detour from our work and spend time with God. We need those daily opportunities to spend in the wilderness at the feet of Jesus so that we can become like him, so that he washes away anything which is unlike him, and so that he can be able to renew our strength from time to time. And while we are in that wilderness experience, alone with God, talking to him, perhaps reading his word, and praying to him, we will also hear him say to us, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Friends, that bush still bends. May God bless. to be, the moment has come. I'd like to invite you to come up front with your wife. And I'll also call upon all ordained ministers in the audience to join us for the prayer of ordination. All ordained pastors, say Pastor Lupandwane. Others, please join us for the prayer of ordination. <coughs>
will ask the congregation to bow heads as we pray. Lord, what an awesome and yet solemn occasion that brings us together here this afternoon. Lord, the ordination of your manservant, Benjamin McKenzie. Lord, we thank you for the family, the McKenzie family that reared this man. Thank you, Lord, that they could teach him to love Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for his spouse, Jennifer Joy, who stands by his side. And Lord, we recognize your call on the life of this man, Benjamin McKenzie. Dear Lord, we pray for divine strength to fulfill that call. We have already seen the fruits of their labor. May many more souls be added to your kingdom because of their ministry. And now, Lord, as we place our hands on Pastor Ben, in recognition of the call, we pray that the Lord of the call may bestow a double portion of his Holy Spirit power on the candidate, Ben McKenzie. We thank you, Lord, for their ministry. And we ask that you will continue to bless them because we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Pastor Penny and Andre Brun to join us on stage. Maybe as she walks up to the stage, as I look down, it was probably almost 32 years ago that we stood together on the stage as first year students. Maybe I must ask the first years to put up their hands. Are there any first years? You remember, Penny, 32 years ago for our first year concert. The Apostle Paul said, Pastor Penny, the spirit God has given does not make us timid. Instead, his spirit fills us with power, love, and self-control. Let us pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, may this be your servant Penny's experience. Guide her and direct her as she seeks and lead your people. Make a wise and an able teacher. Fill her with your love that she may tend to the flock eagerly and willingly. Enable her to do the work of a disciple so that by all means she may be a skillful disciple maker. Keep her faithful in all times of testing humble in times of success, and give her great joy at all times in your service. Teach Penny, good Lord, to serve as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor, not to seek any reward, accept her knowing that she does your will 
through Christ Jesus. Lord, may Penny be a woman of prayer and peace, of faith and vision, of wisdom and boldness, strength and gentleness. Make her transparent with your love and always open to your grace. Merciful Father, it is my earnest prayer that you will fill Penny right now afresh with your spirit. Fill her with power, not least when she preaches your word. Fill her with love, not least when she has to deal with difficult situations. And at all times, may your life be controlled and directed by your spirit as you commission Penny into your service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I greet the church in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And relatives that are here, God bless you. At this time, I'm going to give charge to Pastor Mackenzie and Pastor Brink. God has called you to the work of the ministry and the church. Having recognized the call, uh, has set you aside by the laying of hands. You are now invested with full ecclesiastical authority, no longer honor can come to any person, but such honor also involves great recognition, responsibility, great responsibility. I charge you to minister as servant. As servants, make the master your lifelong study. Know what you teach, but first know who whom you teach. By spending time with Jesus, you will become like Jesus, for it is by beholding that we become charged, changed. As a disciple, is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and as a servant like his master. This is according to Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Pastor Mackenzie and Pastor Brink, I charge you as servant, live like your master lived. Like Jesus, live simply. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant. Philippians chapter 2, 
verse 5 to 7. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engage in warfare and tangled himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier, as a so shoulder. Like Jesus, be what you expected others to become. Be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Verse Timothy, chapter 4, verse 12. Pastor Mackenzie and Pastor Brink, I charge you to minister as shepherds. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. John 10, 11, and 13. Be a shepherd. not a hireling. Work for the sake of the sheep, not for the sake of the mere money. Love Christ supremely and he will help you love his stubborn wayward sheep as he loved them. Be gentle to all, able to teach patiently. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. And remember, your own family is the first flock you are charged to shepherd. I charge you to minister as a watchman. As a watchman, one, so you son of man and you daughter of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say the wicked, O oh, wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood, <coughs> sorry, I will require at your hand. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from the ways, from his ways, and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel 33, verses 7, 8, and 11. As a watchman, win, as a watchman, when Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit 
and they may, the fruits, they may remain. John 15, 16. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and, and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. But you be watchful in all things and your afflictions uh, do the work of the evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Pastor Mackenzie and Pastor Brink, I charge you to minister as teacher. Teach, teach pastorally by training your members to be leaders. And the things that you have had, commit these to faithful men who will be able to reach others also. Second Timothy chapter two, verse two. Teach intelligently by being a lifelong reader of books and student of the word. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is verse 14 of Second Timothy chapter 2. Teach doctrinally. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Christ. Nourish with the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. Take heed to yourselves and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will serve both yourselves and those who hear you. First Timothy chapter 4, 6 and 16 verses. Teach plainly, practically. So even the children listen and understand. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And when your work is ended, may you say with Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid uh, up for me the crown in righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. I invite Dr. Blitz to join me now. my task to welcome Pastor Ben McKenzie, after which Pastor Lucy Ness will welcome Pastor Ben Brink. 
My dear pastor, it is my happy privilege to extend to your hearty welcome into the ranks of the gospel ministry. I welcome you on behalf of your conference and the World Church. Be loyal to its leadership. Make use of its services to assist in your work. Never lose sight of our mission of having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell in the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. I welcome you on behalf of your fellow ministers. Every problem or frustration you will ever face has already been faced and successfully worked through by other ministers. Choose one as your pastor. Let your fellow ministers minister to you. I welcome you on behalf of the congregations you will serve. They are entitled to expect much of us. It is an inspiration and a comfort to remember that their prayers ascend in our behalf, as in turn we look to them as co-workers in soul winning. As a soldier of Christ, you will not be without bruises and scars. None of us can escape them. But when at last we stand victorious on the sea of glass with those for whom we have labored, the nail-scarred hands of our commander will rest lovingly upon these scars. To us, our scars will seem so small compared with his, as we hear him declare, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of our Lord. We continue. Pastor Penny, it is my happy privilege to extend to you a hearty welcome into the ranks of the gospel ministry. I welcome you on behalf of the World Church, be loyal to its leadership. Make use of its services to assist in your work. Never lose sight of our mission of having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. I welcome you on behalf of your fellow ministers Every problem or frustration you will ever face has already been faced and successfully worked through by other ministers. Choose one to pastor you. Allow yourself to be ministered unto by other ministers. As a soldier of Christ, you will not be without bruises and scars. None of us can escape those. But when at last we stand victorious on the sea of glass with those for whom we have labored, the nail-scarred hand of our commander will rest lovingly upon those scars and they will dissipate. To us, our scars will seem so small compared with his. As we hear him declare, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your God. God bless you. my pleasure to ask you to respond to the charge and the call to ministry that you've both accepted. There is no precedent in the order, so I invite Pastor Ben, if you would respond, or and, and then after that, uh, Pastor Ben. Thank you so much. If a preacher 
preachers with power, they say that that preacher is on fire. If a soul winner wins many souls, they say, they say that that soul winner is on fire. If a singer in the praise team sings so sweetly, they say that that singer is on fire. But in ministry thus far, and from the experiences that I've seen of uh, my fellow co-laborers, we have no fuel in and of ourselves. But I thank uh, you, Dr. Masozzi, for the reminder that that bush still burns. And so in response to the charge, in honor to our Heavenly Father, to glorify Jesus Christ, my Savior, and only with the power of the Holy Spirit, I accept this charge. our privilege. Thank you. I would like to respond <coughs> to the charge by our union officer and the prayer by our conference officer. Johnny, thank you for the beautiful prayer. We went through many years together here as a student. <laughs> it's been like many years. Um, I will always remember the words of your prayer. And Pastor Kuneni, I know that God's church op operates best when we are united and when we love each other. And I feel like today that my church has loved me. And that my heart is full of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you for this great privilege of having God's call on my life recognized. <coughs> I would like to respond to what Dr. Mashoshi said. Dr. Mashoshi, your words are not lost on me. We have learnt a lot during the time in which we have waited. And with the theme being time, it would seem today, Dr. Letebi, what time is it? I believe it is time to preach the gospel and to let anyone who's called to preach it preach the gospel because the time is short. I think of my very first year in ministry that taught me so much and I want to say thank you to everyone here who supported me today and who supported my ministry over many, many years, over 28 years in fact, especially my mom. I'm so glad this could take place when she could still join us. Mom, I love you so much and I want to thank her for teaching me to love Jesus from a very, very young age. and to love others. He is a prime example of being kind to others. I want to thank those students who are pastored at UCT in 1994. And I want to end with the same words that they know so well because I think it was our parting sermon. Jesus is coming soon and what happens here is important, but the most important thing is to be there. When Jesus comes on those clouds, whether he has to raise you up from the grave, whether you meet him with shouts of joy, be there. Because Dr. Liz said, it is time. It is time to make ready for Jesus to come. That is my response. May God fill me with the joy expressed in Psalm 27. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, 
to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. I feel that I've been in his temple today. Thank you. I'll ask Mrs. McKenzie. I would like to welcome you again, and you are already there, into this last home, which has curtains that are transparent. I'd like to welcome you to your husband's profession, which is the only profession where the world expects you to have studied with him. When no one will ask a mechanic's wife to be able to fix a car. I'd like to welcome you to a joy-filled house because you have an ordained pastor in the home. I'd like to welcome you to a home where you are a pastor of the ordained pastor. But I'd want to remind you that you are a wife first. Actually, you are a Christian first. Then you are a wife. Then you are a mother. Then you are a shepherdess. Don't confuse those roles. I would like to welcome you to a place where you are going to meet so many people because you are going to be transferred from place to place. But the joy of it is you make friends everywhere. And I'd like to welcome you to a place where you have to choose your words because you are the pastor's wife. People hold them strongly. But above all, I again would want to welcome you to this place which you call home, where people call for a pastor to come and visit, but you have him in the home. Don't lose sight of it. He needs prayer, he's there. He needs prayer, you are there. You are in this last home, and I will tell you, Protect your children, because all eyes are on that home. Welcome, my sister. Thank you, uh, Brother Andrew Frank. Brother Andrew Brink, I want to welcome you to the family of pastoral spouses. Whose husbands are ordained or commissioned to the gospel ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Welcome to a team ministry with your spouse. In Eden, it took both Adam and Eve to represent the image of God and did it adequately. 
in the pastorate, it takes both the strength of a husband and the sensitivity of a wife to represent Christ to the church fully. Your wife's ministry needs you. Whether she has yet learned it or not, but she needs you. To whatever extent you are able, work with him to develop a team ministry fulfilling to the both of you. Your unity will be an example to youth, an attraction to unbelievers, and a source of help to those seeking counsel. And now I want to welcome you to a ministry of your own, because you are an individual. You won't live under the shadow of your pastor wife. You must not be expected to do everything the church and maybe even your wife expect of you. There will be some things you do not feel able to do. Nobody should be expected to do everything. But every church member can do something. I encourage you to find your own place of ministry and fill it. Do not try to be all things to all people. But do consecrate yourself to being all that God wants you to be. Welcome. And now I would ask Mrs. McKenzie to step forward as Mrs. Mishoshi will be handing over their gifts. Please draw close. Where is the paparazzi? Thank you. You may be seated. Mackenzie, please uh, approach the podium, <laughs> not the bench. Thank you, pastors. You may be seated.
because I know that God will take care of me. God will take care of me. Through every day, over all the way, He sure will take care of you. invite the congregation to stand for the benediction. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for making today possible and for being present here through the Holy Spirit. And now I want to leave you with the blessing of Jude. Glory be to him who can keep you from falling and bring you safe to his glorious presence, innocent and happy. To God, the only God, who saves us through Jesus Christ our Lord, be the glory, majesty, authority, and power which he had before time began, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Uh, we have come to the end of our program and we would like to thank uh, the Pastor B and your team. Thank you very much for the music. Uh, uh, Aish, you, you know, you do it, sometimes I'm tempted to want to come up and sing. But while I'm about to come, then I remember that I did not rehearse. <laughs> Then I see it and say, maybe let me, let me not take that risk and spoil. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. Say, I don't know what you do to that thing, but once you touch it, it, it I, can come and, I can come and do the same thing, but it will not do as you. It will not respond the way you respond. But thank you very much. Thank you very much for using your talent for his glory. It's, really, it's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, uh, everyone who came to witness this, uh, please let's keep them in our prayers. We live in the end time and we need prayer more than any other time. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of our program. Let me also thank those that have been uh, relaying this message to other audiences out there. Thank you very much. Uh, I will not mention your names, but the team is standing right there and taking this and showing it to the world. Thank you very much. May God bless you all. Thank you. Maybe let's offer a closing prayer. Ne? Father, we thank you for your mercies upon us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be alive during this time, allowing us to serve during this time. Please put a hedge around us, the same hedge which the devil considered to, that there is a hedge 
around God's children, which he cannot access, accept the permission. Keep us safe, keep us working, keep us watching, and keep us waiting. And we thank you for hearing this prayer through the name of Jesus. Amen. Some want the crown, but they won't bear the cross. It takes everything to serve the Lord. Some want bright mansions, but they won't pay the cost. It takes everything to serve the Lord. everything child to serve the Lord and it takes your time Choose of my Lord. 